Hi everyone! I'm Scientist Kelly here in Seattle, Washington. You have been so fortunate to have Scientist Rachel and Scientist Renee with you through this entire science unit for fourth grade known as Waves, Energy, and Information. It's my pleasure that I get to wrap up chapter four with you where you are going to be applying what you already know about the ways in which dolphins communicate and how that can connect to us as humans. Think back to though what you've learned already and what I've learned already from watching scientist Renee and scientist Rachel. How do dolphins use patterns to communicate? Can you think back? I know it was just, you know, a few chapters ago, maybe even a few days ago for you. What did you learn? How do they use them? Yeah, yeah, I hear you. I know you're saying it in your head right now or you're yelling at your screen right now because dolphins communicate with signature whistles. Do you agree? Thumbs up if you do. Okay, and you're probably still yelling at me about how they also have patterns that uh, change in pitch to create their distinctiveness, right? Okay, let's keep going. They're not the only animals that rely on patterns to communicate. What other animals rely on patterns to communicate? Can you think about that for a minute? I think about it here in Seattle, Washington and what I know. And I often think about that bird that's sitting on the fence. The bird that I spy on secretly, that I can hear its pattern, I can hear its pitch. I wonder what it's saying. What animals have you thought about? Okay. Your question here in chapter four is, how can humans, that's us, use patterns to communicate? Hmm. Do you think we do? Do you think we have one pattern? Do you think we have multiple patterns? What do you think? <laughs> Let's think about how humans can use images to communicate. Where might you see this image here? What message do you think it's trying to send to you? Hmm. <laughs> I think we all recognize this one. What's the message it's trying to send? Is it saying that it's happy? Is it saying that it's sad? Yeah, I think we all know it's happy. Where might you see this one? What message do you think it's trying to send? <laughs> yeah, I hear some of you. You're being funny and you're saying, go faster. But we all know that the message, this bright red sign is sending to us, is to stop. You may have seen it while driving with your parents. You may have seen it walking down the street. Where might you see this one though? This is the one I kind of think, hmm, I wonder how many of you have seen this sign. What message do you think it's trying to send? Let's think about it. If you've never seen it, what do you know about it already? What's the message? There's a fork, there's a knife. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm pretty sure it's trying to tell me that this is a place where I could eat, or you could eat, or your whole group could eat. It's a place where we could go and find food. We know that just based on a fork and a knife. Today, I'm going to create a message in the form of an, in of an image, pardon me, and I'm going to send it to you. You may find this to be more challenging than you expect. You might find it easy, but I do want you to think about how it's being communicated while we do it. If you have your science notebook, your packet from the district, you're going to use the grid on page 81. If you do not have your notebook or your packet from the district, do not worry. I just need you to grab a piece of paper and a pencil. We're going to create our own grid to start. This is my grid <laughs> that I quickly drew out and I'm going to show you how to draw one out because it's important that you have seven columns, okay, in seven rows. That'll help in our communication from one to the other. Let me pull up the paint pad. Okay, so here I have my box already created. I have two vertical lines right in the middle. Now when I think about the size of this box, 
I think about maybe the size of a post-it. It could be a scrap piece of paper. It could be anything that you have available. So you're going to draw a box with two uh, vertical lines going down in the center. From there, you're going to draw two more lines to the right. And mine are a little squiggly, sorry, doesn't, it's okay. And two more lines to the left. That gives us seven vertical columns. And now we're going to draw the columns horizontally. And I'm gonna start in the middle again. I'm going to draw two more on the top and two on the bottom. Okay, so we have a seven by seven grid and this will be helpful because that's what I'll be working off of to help try to communicate to you what image I want to convey. Okay, here we go. So if this is the grid that's sitting in front of you, I first want you to color in the second square from the right on the top. The second square from the right from the top. I need you now to color in the second square from the left on the top. on the second row, the second row, I want you to color in the first three left and the first three right. On the second row, the first three left, the first three on the right. On the third row, I want you to color it in all the way. You're going to color in all those. On the fourth row, you need to color in the middle five. The middle five. On the fifth row, color in the middle three. On the fifth row, color in the middle three. On the sixth row, color in the one middle grid, the one middle square. You got it? Give you just another minute. Okay, let's see. Does your grid look like this? Do you have a heart? Do you have a heart? Wait, what? Some of you do? Okay, very cool. Are some of your hearts a little skewed? Hmm, interesting. Okay, so how did I send my message? How did I do it? If I was the sender here, if I'm the sender and you were the listener, what was so challenging about it? Were you able to see what I was trying to communicate when I showed you the image? Yeah, it was hard. What does it mean from the center? What does it mean from the left? Yeah, that's right. How would this activity be more difficult if your partner were sitting across the room? I mean, here we are. You could be anywhere in the U.S., anywhere in the world right now, and I tried to communicate this image to you. But imagine being in the classroom. What would happen if you were with a partner and you were talking across the room? What if you were in different rooms? What if one of you were in the library and one of you were in your classroom? Okay, I want you to be thinking about these things as we move through chapter four in this unit. I challenge you, I challenge you to use a post-it, to use a scrap piece of paper, set up the grid. You might have to set it up twice, one for you and one for your mate. Set up the grid, 
Try it. Try sitting across the room and try to do, to describe your image. Try to communicate it across. See if you're successful. Play around with it. Have fun. Okay, I'll see you in the next segment where we'll read a book and have a little more fun with some communication. Thank you. Hi, scientists. It's Scientist Kelly coming to you from Seattle, Washington, and I'm so happy to be here with you. I think you might remember what's over my shoulder here. You can tell I had a little memory from doing the heart with you, had a little fun with my husband, doing the the messaging with the grid, the seven by seven grid that we did in the previous lesson. I said hi, and then I did a tree. Um, it was a good time, and I hope that you tried that challenge out with somebody in your family to see how it was being the communicator versus, you know, the receiver of the information like you were with me. Today, we're going to continue on with human communication, and I still need you to be thinking about what you learned about the bottlenose dolphin and how it communicated and transferring that knowledge to you as a human. And how is it that we communicate as humans? Scientists today, you are going to need page 84 in your science notebook or your district packet that you have. Um, you can just use a piece of paper, a notebook if you have it. Doesn't necessarily matter because the whole goal is for you to be listening, visualizing, and jotting a note. You can tell on page 84 here that we're looking at patterns in human communication. And there's a variety of communication methods noted in the left column, and the right column is us to be thinking about what patterns do each of these use. For example, communication method language, you're going to listen to me read. You might follow along with me on the screen here. And then you're going to jot a note about what patterns do languages use. Talking drums. Oh, I'm excited. <laughs> We're going to learn a lot today, I think. Talking drums. What's the pattern? Semaphore. What's the pattern? Do you even know what a semaphore is? Yeah, I think I'm going to learn something today. Telegraph. Yeah, I think some of you are going to know what a telegraph is. But can you think about what pattern does it use? And then, of course, everything that we're on these days, the digital devices, and what's the pattern that it's using? Remember this book? <laughs> yeah, I love this book. It was a reference book that contains information about how animals, including us humans, use patterns to communicate. This is what I'll be reading from today. Which part of the book should we read to find out more about human communication? When I'm looking at the table of contents here, what do you think? Yes, <laughs> I hear some of you. I hear you. I know you're telling me right now that we should go to human communication. Remember that the subheadings, such as human communication, tells us some more topics about it. So let's see. Ooh. Language, talking drums, semaphore, telegraph, digital devices. Hmm. I think that was the same list that we just talked about on page 84 in your notebook. We're going to read to learn more about the ways people use patterns to communicate. Remember, it's all about the humans right now. But we're going to look at it where it's across short and long distances. It may help you to try to visualize as I read and as you read along with me. Like, can you picture it up in your mind when I read it out loud? That'll help you to kind of create understanding of how it might work and what the patterns are. Remember, we're looking at the patterns. The introduction here says, humans communicate for many reasons, to share ideas or information, to persuade each other, to ask questions, to express feelings, and more. Over time, humans have developed many creative ways to communicate with others near and far. Recent technology advances have given us the ability to send messages across long distances, 
quickly and clearly in ways that were not possible before. For instance, before telephones, we had to use written language to communicate, communicate across long distances because sounds could only travel so far before degrading or breaking down. Now we can pick up the phone to talk to people far away and they sound like they're standing right next to us. Our methods of communication often change as we develop new technology. However, all of our communication methods have something important in common. They rely on patterns. Humans often, often use patterns called codes. We have developed many different codes for communicating messages, such as visual symbols and patterns of tapping noises. Even language is a code. Words are sounds that mean something in the mind of the listener. When we speak to one another, we use patterns in our words that others can understand. I want you to notice that the text says that all communication relies on patterns. What kinds of patterns have we already learned about that dolphins use to communicate? Yeah, again, yeah, they're distinct signature whistles, the different pitches. Yeah, 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 very good. We're gonna read about several methods that humans use to communicate. As we read each section, think about how the communication method uses patterns. Okay, here's our first one. Look at your page 84 really quick. Language. Humans all over the world use language to communicate with one another. There are thousands of languages in the world. Language can be communicated in writing, through speaking, or through gestures and body language. Languages can be very different, but they all rely on patterns to communicate information. For instance, many written languages rely on alphabets. Ooh, the ABCs. This book is written in a language called English, which relies on an alphabet of 26 letters. Combining the letters of an alphabet into patterns creates words and sentences. Other languages rely on different kinds of patterns. The Chinese language uses symbols that represent parts of words or whole words. People who speak Chinese use combinations of these characters to convey messages to one another through writing. Ooh, I'm excited. Talking drums. In West Africa long ago, people developed a way of communicating through drums. These drums are called talking drums because the sounds they make are similar to the patterns of spoken language. The sounds from the drums can have different pitches, ooh, a word we know, and can be played at different volumes. A drummer can create different types of sounds by hitting a talking drum in different places with a drumstick, the palm of the hand, or the fingers. Drummers send information by making different patterns of sounds, and these travel as sound waves over long distances. People can hear the drums from far away and understand a complicated message. Of course, people in West Africa today have many other ways to communicate across long distances, including computers and cell phones. However, many have kept the tradition of this unique form of communication. Ooh, here's another good one. Semaphore, this is something we're all gonna learn. In France and other countries in the early 1800s, people used a system of communicating over long distances called the semaphore. On hilltops, people would build towers that could be seen from far away. Each semaphore tower had long wooden boards on top. A person would arrange the wooden boards in different shapes 
to send messages. Each shape represented a certain letter or number. People far away could see patterns in the shape and understand the message. Because a semaphore message is understood visually, this kind of message travels as light waves. Sending a semaphore message was a lot faster than riding a horse over a long distances to deliver a message in person. However, in bad weather, the semaphore tower and the position of the wooden boards could be hard to see, so the signal could sometimes be lost over long distances. The Telegraph The telegraph was first developed in 1800s. It was a system of communicating over long distances by sending electrical signals. At the time, it was considered a fast and efficient way to send information. The electrical signals traveled as waves through wires connecting the telegraph stations. To send telegraph messages, people used a system of long and short sounds called Morse code. Morse code is still sometimes used today. In Morse code, each letter of the alphabet is represented by a certain pattern of sounds. To send a telegraph message, an operator would make a pattern of tapping sounds spelling out words in Morse code. The telegraph machine would change the tapping sounds into electrical signals that traveled to another telegraph machine far away. The faraway machine turned the electrical signals into patterns of long and short beeping sounds. The telegraph operator at the faraway machine could listen to the sounds and decode them and to understand the message. Digital devices, something I believe we're all familiar with. Digital devices include computers, cell phones, and tablets. Even televisions, toys, and cars often contain digital devices. More and more, humans rely on digital devices to communicate because they allow us to send complicated messages clearly and quickly across long distances. Believe it or not, all these digital devices use a code that involves patterns of just two numbers, zero and one. This code is called binary code, and people use it to program these devices to perform, perform specific actions. Patterns of zeros and ones serve as instructions for digital devices. Every time you type a message, your device converts each letter into binary code and sends that code to another device. The other device recognizes the code and displays the letters of your message to the person receiving it. Similarly, when you talk on a cell phone, your phone uses binary code to convert your voice to binary form and send it. Ooh, so interesting. Your friend's phone converts that binary signal back into sound so your friend can hear it. Digital devices use binary code to send images, text, sound, such as voices, and even movies. Information that has been changed into binary code is called digitized information. Before digitized information, Messages could only travel so far before degrading or breaking down. For instance, a sound signal can be loud, but there is still a limit on how far that sound can travel. With digital devices, humans can now send messages to someone halfway around the world with the click of a button. And that message will arrive looking or sounding exactly as intended. So interesting. Okay, so let's think about it. 
What information did you record about how the communication methods use pat patterns? The language, remember it talked about the alphabet and how the alphabet could be arranged in combinations to create words that we as listeners recognize. Talking drums, remember it was the sound waves and how, which part of their hand they may have used and how fast or how slow. A semaphore, remember they used the wooden boards on top of the structure um, and they form letters to help you communicate. A telegraph, remember it was about the Morse code and the short and long beeping sound that would be transferred. And then the di digital devices, remember the patterns are zeros and ones. The binary code that's utilized to take my voice and put it through this computer out to your device, to take my call and put it through the computer, to get um, and play your game. Every little thing in the digital world is on the binary code. And that's what we're gonna be talking about in 4.2. I look forward to seeing you again and be thinking about zeros and ones, or maybe even trying this thing again the seven by seven grid. See if you can get your message across. Okay, see you soon, scientists. Bye.